Welcome everyone to this meeting of uh, Workers International Network. Um, we, this is one of our regular Sunday meetings and um, it's a great opportunity this afternoon because we have uh, Anthony Collio Kotsis with us, um, who's um, been involved in the labor movement in Greece for decades. And um, this is an opportunity to really um, make, uh, um, make an appraisal of revolution and counter-revolution as it's transpiring in Europe. Um, the Greek working class probably more so than any other working class in Europe, has been at the forefront of resistance to fascism and austerity, um, fighting back against the, the horrors of, of right-wing regimes. Uh, even from the time of the Second World War, the brutality and the heroism shown the brutality that the Greek working class were subjected to and the heroism that they showed in resistance against the Nazis was second to none in the fight against fascism across Europe. We had in the 1960s, we had a period where many countries were experiencing a kind of revival of freedoms with youth culture and um, uh, you know, new new ways of um, dealing more democratically with society, and Greek society was plunged into a dictatorship under the colonels, um, really brutal dictatorship, um, full of corruption and horror and torture. Uh, we then had, with the development of the EU, we then had. Greece as the first country of, of, of other countries that are now following in, in, in its um, footsteps, the first country to resist the pressure for neoliberal policies and for austerity by the, the bankers of, of Europe and the bankers of the world with, with the Syriza government um, really um, bringing things to a, a head with the, the resistance that was made in the first half of 2015 to the attempts by the European banks, eventually successful, to cow the Greek people into submission. And um, then even after that, there have been, there've been struggles, there's been resistance in Greece against um, you know, a terrible counter-revolution that's been taking place. Now, the task of Marxists is not to either be falsely optimistic or falsely pessimistic, but to get a balance sheet, to draw up a balance sheet, to be realistic about what the pressures are in society, what, the, what retreats have to be made, and also look for and see points of departure through which a new movement and new resistance can come into, into operation. We're not idealists. We're not basing ourselves on hopes and we're not basing ourselves on despair. We're basing ourselves on a scientific analysis of society. And it's with that in mind that I'm asking Anthony, Anthony to, to speak on the situation in Greece, the, the, the struggles leading up to um, 2015 and an appraisal of those struggles and what the implications are for those struggles for Greek and European workers today. So over to you, Anthony. Right, thank you, Ed. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to your meeting. Um, actually, uh, my, I'm not involved decades in the Greek labor movement. Actually, for the first 10 years of my involvement, was, I was a member of the Labour Party uh, in two constituencies in London, Haringey and then the Thames Mead. So my political education actually took place within, for a decade, in uh, the British Labour Party. Coming here, joining PASOK, before its final kind of um, 
um, well, it's end and change of name. And, uh, and then I moved into Syriza after two years ago when the right wing uh, won the elections. But coming here and joining PASOK and seeing the situation, the labor movement, in, in contrast to how the labor movement was in Britain, um, for me, it was quite a uh, shock, cultural shock, political cultural shock in terms of cut it and how, uh, how, you know, the left, not only the left, but uh, in general, the working class was uh, in different parties and uh, different associations in different organizations. And of course, among with, with that, Marxist, domestic Marxist, revolutionary sources and so on. So one of the main aspects of the last 10 years in Greece uh, is this diaspora for that, you know, to use a Greek word that we have seen uh, of um, both Marxism and the working class. And it's in, in, the, in, in, in search for finding a common a unified way to, to counteract, uh, as you said, uh, the bankers' attack, the European Union's, you know, the Europe's ruling class attack. But uh, the discussion of Greece is also interesting in terms of the analysis of international Marxism and domestic Marxism um, had in relation to the movement of Greek society in those days. Uh, how Greek society reacted and uh, in the, the way Syriza developed, in the nature of the mass demonstrations, the class nature of mass demonstrations that took place for many years in uh, Sidangma Square, in the nature of uh, the Greek labor movement, uh, of how it reacted, was it revolutionary, was it not, in the nature of Syriza, was it a workers' party, is it still a workers' party, is it ever going to be a mass party, these are still questions that have not been answered. In the way, the role of the middle class, the middle class, the political representatives, the reformists, to be exact, all manifestation reformists took uh, took, uh, took uh, the role in, in those events. And most importantly, is, uh, is uh, uh, the infatuation that Marxist, big percentage of Marxists had with this populist search that took place through Europe, South Europe, uh, to be, to be, you know, to be more precise, and uh, the way uh, Marxism rallied, Marx tendencies, Marx organizations rallied under middle class banners, under the notion of critical support, which for me has always been a very problematic notion. Critical support. It means that as long as that you can have a platform whereby you can uh, promote a program, your program, your organization programs. It means that you can be shared at platform, regardless of the historical uh, realities of the reasons, historical reasons why that platform existed. So, under the notion of critical support, um, a lot of revolutionaries found themselves attached to, 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 to reformism, to populism, on the basis of uh, being able to promote their own organizational uh, material needs, rather than thinking of uh, whether. The existence of that platform was um, was a development of class struggle and class motion and advancement of class consciousness. Also, it was the inability of Marxism to differentiate at that in that period. But again, it's not obviously, but it was a very big trend of the majority of Marx domestically uh, to differentiate between uh, left wing reformism and and left wing populism. Where, on the one hand, when, when in, in, the, in the past, when we had the surge of left of left wing reformism, it was it happened as 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 a, a way of the petty bourgeoisie of left reformists trying to take control of an advancing working class, of a working class that, having gone through economic struggle, put forward the unions, have achieved a kind of a political unity through a mass party. And it is at that point that we're going to become create a crisis in, in, the, in the bourgeois democratic system. And so where left wing reformism finds itself as uh, the way to, 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 um, to stop that advancement. Whereas populism, left wing populism, finds itself in the absence of working class movement, where, the, where um, 
not only in the absence, it tries to actually not, it does not ask for the working class to advance, it uh, simply asks for the, its, their support and their support under the demands and the, um, the, the notions of, of, of populist reformism. So it, it asks for the vote, for their support as, a, as, a, as, a, as voters in general, but only, only to, that, to that part. It does not seek for the further development of, uh, of uh, the working class. Uh, so in a very perverse way, Greek Marxism, by attaching itself to populism as, as developed in Syriza, it found itself detached from the working class because Syriza itself was detached from, uh, from the actual uh, material condition of the working class and the working class as it was at the, the labor movement, the Greek labor movement. Um, and so it attached to, to, um, uh, to a section of the middle class that found itself in, in Syriza. And uh, in, as I said, in a very perverse way, in order to realize the, the program that they were advancing, they, they were dependent on the ability of, uh, of populist reformists to, 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 to promote that program, who themselves, in the end, were dependent on the, on the European Union class to make concessions to their program. So, in, 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 ironically, Marxists felt dependent on, on, on European capitalism or whether European capitalism would allow their program to find, um, to find, uh, to be realized within the parameters of Greek bourgeois democracy. So the question is whether the, the Greek labor movement was able to, to, to move as a unified as a class. And the, the reality of the, of the, in the answer is definitely not. It was not at any stage or in, in a condition where uh, they were able to move as a class, unified. Um, they could not enter Syriza because firstly, um, as I will, I, I, will, I will talk about it later on, Syriza did not ask them to enter. In fact, they didn't, they didn't want them to enter. But most, but let's not forget that when Syria uh, was created in 2004 as an alliance, as an alliance of factions organizations, it operated as such. It, it operated under an alliance of factions. So it was almost impossible in order for someone to go to go into Syria at that period of time, you needed to go through a faction. You actually had to, um, we actually had to um, become, a, or not become a member of the faction, but the whole discussion would be in terms of the program of each faction and what positions each faction could uh, have within, within the organization structure of Syriza and how prevalent, prevalence uh, its, uh, its, its organization of faction could be. Um, and the other, of course, uh, aspect of uh, the ability of the Greek labor movement to move in, in a unified manner is that it had abandoned PASOK since the 90s. After the collapse of, of Andreu government in 88, 89, uh, and the national unity government, which funnily enough, it, re, it happened again 25 years later. And it's funny how all we know that, how ironic how history kind of repeats itself. But in the 90s, PASOK was abandoned, um, both by the most avant, you know, the avant-garde of, uh, of the left, the left itself, and um, even the union bureaucracies, uh, obviously having had a special relationship with uh, PASOK and uh, knowing very well that um, um, that they could they could they could with simple uh, minor industrial actions they could shake the uh, PASOK government or the internal the internal um, uh, balances of uh, of the uh, PASOK leadership, um, they they themselves had created this bureaucratic link, and and they, and they themselves had uh, so you know unions had also moved away from actual participation within PASOK. So PASOK was abandoned in the hands of the modernizers, as they were called, which is sort of you know Blair third wave type of uh, uh, notion of, of the, the time. 
Of course, obviously, by 2011, when it came to 2011, they very easily sacrificed uh, uh, one of the most significant parties in order to push forward for, to, for the vote for the second memorandum. So they sacrificed the Workers' Party uh, under the notion of, uh, how, of the responsibility towards uh, European, the European uh, ruling class. So in 2011, um, uh, Papandreou Jr., the son of Papandreou, was in fact the person who actually, uh, in, 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 you know, in, 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 again, in, in a very ironic way, the person that, uh, that, created, that ended the uh, um, period of Paso. In 2011, when the second voter memorandum took place, 22, I think, MPs, left MPs, uh, voted against it. They were expelled, expelled immediately from the uh, parliamentary group. Two also had been expelled in a previous vote. Another 20 or 30 uh, were told that they wouldn't take part, uh, wouldn't be part of the list, of the electoral list in the future elections. So uh, like that, the government fell, obviously lost its majority, and uh, it pretty much, uh, having, having, having played its role, where it, it put forward, it voted for the referendum, it took, it took, it, re it retreated and allowed um, the right wing and the bankers to create an interim government. The Greek labor movement, uh, obviously, as I said, had, had, had taught not to operate like that. They, whenever there was a, a, a crisis, uh, it only took, it would only take a, a union with a prolonged uh, industrial action to shake not only the Paso government, but, but also a government um, of uh, new democracy. Now, when new democracy in 1990 took over under Mitsotakis, which is the dad of the current prime minister, you, we had the teachers union in 90 that won in the election, and in 1991, 1992, the bus drivers. They went in long industrial and uh, long industrial actions uh, month, and uh, they shook to the ground uh, the, the government of new democracy, creating a major internal, internal crisis, uh, which in the end, it fell after a year. Um, now, so it had taught that in the only thing, the, it, it could only, what was required was for economic action of a single union to shape events and force the political establishment to capitulate to or to do some to the demands. Of course, this time things were different because the Greek labor movement this time was not going up against um, a Greek government. It wasn't just a uh, right wing Greek government or PASO. There were actually representatives of the European ruling class. And uh, to, to an extent, with uh, in 2013, when new democracy came back in power, now in a national government, well, not a national government, but with partners PASOK and the MAR, which was another center left party just, that had just been created, partly from PASOK, members of PASOK, and uh, partly from members of Sinas Firmos, which was the predecessor of Syriza. Uh, when the right wing, that right wing government came to in 2013, there were actually, as I said, representatives of, of not just the Greek ruling class, but the European ruling class, which was uh, the, you know, the Greek banks and the whole political system was completely linked with. So they were galvanized, they were, if you like, empowered by, uh, by, the European, by European capital to crush uh, any attempt of, uh, of, the, of the Greek labor movement to, um, to move uh, against uh, the austerity measures they were prepared to bring. Um, but the main aspect of that, of that period was that the Greek labor movement remained partyless. There was no party actually to move in. Obviously, Pasok had, had, had uh, completely fallen under the weight of, uh, of, of deciding to push forward a memorandum. Whatever voices, political voices, in 2011, internal battles took place then were minor because as I said, not only it was uh, 
having having lost it's, it's the parliamentary uh, power having lost the labor left labor and peace it kind of it, it, it having not having a nucleus of people to actually put forward the discussion uh, of uh, where, where 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 was the future of the of, of the labor movement of the working class of the organized labor movement having lost all that ability to do so uh, and now having having taken becoming uh, the, the helper of the right wing by participating in the government obviously Paso was obviously was not going to be the party that uh, the working class the group working class would move into so for the last period the group working class remain partyless and the only thing it uh, could do is actually join the streets so and I'm not talking about industrial but actually join the streets in terms of protesting and that's how we found many, many workers actually participating in the, in the protest uh, in Sidangma Square. But, but the, the fundamental issue is that they didn't participate as a class. They participated as individuals in the manner the middle class, uh, the Greek middle class, this had decided to move and express its own uh, revolt against the austerity measures, which was participating in the Sidangma Square. So Sidangma Square, uh, was a you know an ununified um, um, you know crowd where you could find all sorts of people from all from many classes with um, ideologies uh, reaching from fascism nationalism all the way up to, to revolution. Um, it was um, quite, quite astonishing to be amongst uh, that crowd, and I'm not talking about in a positive way. Um, because some, at, at points, it reminded me, for whoever has, has read the George Orwell in 1984, in that, in that book, at some point, there is, uh, the, they have the, I think it was 10 minute hate break or 20 minute hate break, whereby they were gathering in front of a tele screen and the pictures they were shown and uh, they were, you know, a group of workers, they would shout and swear at the, the tele screen and, uh, basically blow off steam and it was exactly that but that was happening in front of parliament thousands of people shouting uh, curses uh, swearing uh, signaling following at parliament obviously there were aspects in parliament square which was later on they talked about how there was the, you know the upper square and the lower square where there was attempts obviously to create uh, uh, sort of uh, associations um, and pass, pass different uh, voting and all that. But at the end of the day, um, the character of, of those, those participating there was completely middle class in terms of that they were in effect trying to protest against, they weren't measuring the strength against the strength. They, they weren't making demands when the working class moves, it moves as a way to measure its ability to counter the state. The people there were there as an effort to try and, in a way, made into beggars uh, as to hope, hoping that their voices, their participation, their mass participation would be enough for the bourgeois establishment, for bourgeois democratic establishment to listen to them and to feel sorry for them. Uh, um, Anthony, can I just tell you, you've had about 20 minutes now. Really? Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, that, take, take a little more time, but we must leave okay. some time for discussion as well. So kind of, you know, try and focus on the, the conclusions if you can. Sure, sure. So the organ the 2013, the, the working class started moving, but it moved in the way they knew. You had the seafarers union, you had the um, the teachers union, and you had the um, the underground workers union, the transport workers union, moving again as they did in, in 1991-92, hoping that you have been the same. This time they were met with brutal with brutality by some other government, evoking a law from from junta from the junta uh, years where you can military we can you can use a military law to conscript. Um, uh, a civil section, both its personnel and its equipment. So under that threat, every time a workers' union would move, they would put back back into uh, uh, into their place, 
um, empowering the ability and feeling more empowered by every victory the government would have. Also, the participation was very small. The, the general, the general uh, unions of, uh, of public workers and, 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 and uh, private workers had made a few attempts with one 24-hour strikes, 48-hour strikes, which had completely uh, 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 worried down uh, the ability, you know, the, the labor movement. And by the time, by 2013, 2014, uh, there was simply not enough energy left. In that time, Syriza, that, I mean, that is the, 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 the crash of the issues here. Syriza, the more the, the more the working class was moving, the more the industrial action was taking place, the more it could see how how un, undetached they it was from uh, from those struggles and how much a link it did not have to those movements. And whenever it called for a rally or a participation, mass participation in the square, the uh, it was deplorable the amount of people that tend to. So the more uh, the movement, the working class was, mean, was, uh, was uh, moving, the more it actually enclosed itself within, within parliament, uh, concentrating on how, on the importance of elections and calling for elections. It did not want the, uh, the class struggle to expand. It actually wanted, uh, because the, the ex an exposed and attenuated class struggle meant that it had to have take a place, take position, against such circumstances. So always its philosophy was, and that it was a philosophy that was, it was promoting to the, to the European ruling class, that look what this government is doing, is creating a social crisis. We can be the pacifiers of this crisis. We can be the ones that can bring balance, social balance, like before. So as soon as the, the, the need, the, 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 as soon as an opportunity for elections took place, and we must not forget, we must not forget how a series of, came into power. It came into power through a fluke. They took advantage of a, a, a loophole, constitutional loophole, to create, uh, to, 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 to create the elections. Well, the, uh, the loophole was if there, there used to be a law, if the parliament could not agree for a president, election would be called. Parliament did not agree for a president in 2014, so elections were, were called. And uh, this lack, this lack of its link to the working class, to the labor movement, was seen in, in how the uh, society voted. First of all, 50% almost, 40, 45% did not vote. And that was a majority of the working class. Um, and Syriza, in order to achieve power, it had to ally itself uh, with a nationalist party. And that is the reality of, of the matter. By February, with and after six, uh, Syriza took its place, its role into delivering the memorandums like the governments before. The working class of Greece is still absent; it still lacks a party. Even though I am in Syriza right now, I'm trying to organize things uh, locally. Um, whether Syriza will exist in two, three, four years, it is uh, it's a big question. There is a lack of link between the electoral bit, you know, the parliamentary bit, and, and a link with the, the rest of the labor movement. So much that one feels that if the next elections, and this is the way uh, actually the leadership is, 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 is moving and is uh, operating, if the, the, the next elections are not successful, then you feel that it might, you know, this, this bubble might blow up. But more importantly, having, uh, having understood where the electoral base is, which is within that 55% that have always been the voters, and those have always been the people in squares, uh, the same people that uh, marched against uh, North Macedonia and uh, the, the deal of North Macedonia, that middle class, they are okay in terms of approaching that, trying to take that, as much of, as that bit, rather, that trying to radicalize the, the, the 45 percent of the, which is the dominantly working class that stays at home and is has become apathetic and apolitical. If I, I, if I, if I 25 minutes, yeah, I think I'm going to leave it there and uh, you know we can have a discussion about it. Okay, thank you, thank very, you very much, Anthony. I, I, I apologize for sort of. No, no, I apologize for miscalculating the time.
but but anyway, thank you. you you've pre presented a lot of very interesting and provocative material, which will create a discussion, I think. So uh, well done, Anthony, and um, thanks for your contribution. Um, uh, there, there'll be plenty of time at the end as well, Anthony, for you to respond to what comrades uh, may, may have to say. So um, the, I'm, I'm about to throw the meeting open to the floor if comrades would like to indicate by raising their hands or, or um, you know, electronically raising your hand is preferable actually, but I'll, if, even if you wave on the screen because there's only one screen at the moment, I think I'll probably see you. Who would like to say something? Uh, okay, For, uh, well, okay, we have, um, I'm gonna take Themos first and then Roger. Well, first of, uh, first of all, I, I want to thank uh, Anthony for a quite uh, accurate portrayal of, uh, of the events uh, in Greece. And uh, these events are, uh, are something that uh, constitute a fair uh, material for discussion, not only in this context, but in the context of, I think, of the uh, the stance of the uh, of the left uh, worldwide, because the way we see these events is important, and uh, I think we should uh, uh, we should um, see these events not only in the way that Anthony sees them, because uh, although these events uh, are the way he described them, I, I I have a slightly different reading. Of the first thing is the story of Pasok, and that is important. I don't think that Pasok was finished in the, in the 90s. What was finished in the 90s, it was the specific leadership of Pasok. It's the specific politics that Pasok was, uh, was carrying with it. But Pasok was more than that. Pasok was the, the legacy of Andreas Papandreou, the legacy of, of, of radicalism, the legacy of, uh, of, of um, of the, uh, of the heritage of the, of the communists, of the, of the resistance. And it, 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 it was still there even under Semitis, even under the Blairites. The same way, more or less, that uh, the Labour Party was there even after Blair and the new Labour uh, period, as we saw in the period of Corbyn. And it, it is no mistake, it is no, uh, it is no, uh, 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 it is not uh, uh, by chance that uh, Papandreou in, in, uh, in 2009 won a landslide for Pasok. The son of pa Andreas Papandreou, George Papandreou, he presented a hope for the Greek people, for the Greek working class, if you want. And that's why he got all that, that, that uh, a huge majority in the, those elections because people expected him to revive what Pasok stand, stood for in the previous period. He failed to do so. And that's, that failure is what uh, finished Pasok, as you as correctly Anthony said. And it's important to see that uh, uh, it's uh, uh, parties are more than their specific policies, parties are more than, than their specific leaderships. The same, the same thing happens uh, later, I think, with Syriza, and also the rise of Syriza and the participation in the, of the working class in the state. There, I have some disagreement as well, although it happened. Uh, revolutions don't happen because uh, there is an organized uh, working class planning them. Revolutions may succeed because there is an organized working class, but usually what we see is a revolution uh, of uh, not being pure, not being, uh, not being something, uh, uh, a, a struggle for socialism only. It's just an explosion of, of the people in which the working class plays a role and the significance of that role is, is crucial for the success of the revolution. The revolution, be, uh, in Greece, no, sorry, the events in Greece were revolutionary. And what happened in Sydney Square? Yes, it was, uh, uh, it was middle class mostly. 
on the surface, but underneath, it was a, 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 the rise of the people, including the working class. And there, uh, I think that uh, we should uh, we should see that uh, calling for elections was not just uh, it was not just a, a side issue. It was important to turn that. Uh, uh, that explosion into political action. And that, that's why Syriza succeeded. Syriza succeeded because he was part of this movement and because he offered a way forward uh, uh, in, uh, uh, by, by calling for elections, taking part in the elections and succeeding in gaining power, gaining power on the basis of a program that was pretty modest. It was the Thessaloniki program. And they tried to reverse austerity, but to do that, they had to fight the European uh, ruling class. And in that fight, I think they did an admirable job throughout the first half of 1915. And the proof of that was that they were gaining support uh, in the whole of Europe. They didn't just, they didn't yet win uh, an outright support, but their influence was growing and hopes were growing all over Europe and all over the world mostly. And, and, and crucially, they won the Greek people. I mean, 62% in the referendum of June the 6th, June the 5th. It's, it, it's a triumph for, for their policies. And there, what happened? Instead of going forward and translating this into revolutionary way forward, they just capitulated. And that's what changed the, the situation. So I think we should read a lot of revolutionary lessons into this, uh, this development and see where it went wrong, how it went wrong, and what, uh, what is going to be our, uh, our work in the future. This, I think is one of the of the study cases that we have to to see in our work and see how it develops. The others, of course, being Jeremy Corbyn in Britain, Bernie Sanders in uh, uh, in America, uh, uh, the Arab Spring. All these are important case studies that. Should, uh, should inform our revolutionary thinking and not just uh, see that they failed uh, something well, some, uh, we shouldn't look at. It. In a sense, the Russian revolution failed. But what, what, what rich lessons do we get out of it? That's how we should build our work, I think. And it follow their steps where they went right and try to avoid their mistakes. Thank you. Thank you, Themos. Roger, it's over to you now. Thank you to, uh, for Anthony for introducing this uh, discussion on a very important question. I'd like to say, I mean, Anthony knows that we, um, we do have differences on um, our analysis of the, uh, or balance sheet, if you like, on the experiences of, the, of uh, what happened in Greece. And um, I know that um, he'll expect me to put an alternative case um, as clearly as he did uh, his case. I, I would say, look, after every big revolutionary event, after every defeat, a mood of despondency arises. And there's no doubt about it, there's been a very serious defeat in, uh, in Greece. But the ruling class had been in no doubt about the meaning of these events. I could take uh, any number of quotations from, very, from various leading spokespeople for the ruling class, but let me just take one, Donald Tusk of the European Union, who said um, in, in the course of these events, I'm really afraid of the political contagion of this Greek crisis, when he said that um, it, it could be an explosive combination, that's the rhetoric of the far left leaders, as he called them, and the high youth unemployment. I can feel, he said, something like widespread impatience. And he said, when impatience becomes not an individual, but a social experience of feeling, this is the introduction for revolution. 
And they were afraid, the European ruling class or the world ruling class were afraid that the uh, events in Greece would provide the contagion for revolutionary uprisings throughout Europe and the world. And between 2010 and 2015, there was a, a, a most spectacular uprising of the Greek uh, population. And by the way, it was not isolated. The, uh, the upsurge in Greece coincided with the Arab Spring, the movement of the Indignados in Spain, the uh, Sanders and Corbyn phenomena in uh, USA and Britain, and the first stirrings, if you like, worldwide of the upsurge of protests that has gripped the world and that we've examined closely every week in our WIN meetings uh, through first-hand eyewitness reports from Brazil to the USA to Sudan to Iran to India and uh, countless points in between. And Syriza, I mean, it's, uh, I, I don't think there's any difference between us on the shortcomings and the failures of uh, Syriza. But Syriza was not the originator of the movement, it was a product of the movement. And on finding itself propelled to power, maybe to its own surprise, it had deluded itself that its negotiating skills could somehow mitigate the terms of the bankers. But of course, what was looming over the negotiating table was the monstrous shadow of the very real crushing power of the banks. And what counterweight could Syriza throw into the scales against uh, that, that power? Only the force that had propelled it into and behind that, the potential solidarity of the working class and the youth of Europe. And that was the threat that Tusk had had in mind. Now, the real issue is what was the nature of these, um, these events? Did the working class of Greece mobilize? Did it mobilize as a class? Because that's a point that um, Anthony has made. Yes, I would say, uh, uh, you know, without any question beyond any question, in constant strikes, demonstrations, occupations, and actually in 42 general strikes within the course of five years. 42 is probably a conservative uh, count. In all of history, it would be hard to find better examples of popular mobilization. And of course, we can say, well, demonstrations aren't revolutions. It wasn't a workers' movement. They should have occupied their workplaces and so on. But let's take each of those objections uh, in turn. Not a workers' movement? Well, what do we mean by the working class? Can we, we should avoid a sentimental uh, uh, sort of um, image of that. Um, in Britain, where's the working class? Where are the coal mines now? Where's the shipyards? Where are the steelworks? Where are the car plants today? The biggest prolonged natural strikes of recent years in Britain have been the strikes of hospital doctors and university lecturers. And the youth are employed on dead end zero hour contracts. So all the more so in Greece, where there have never been large scale industrial enterprises. What's happening is that society is becoming not less, but more proletarian. The middle class is shrinking to insignificance. The workers now include teachers and nurses, computer operators and so on. So, you know, they may not be wearing overalls, but, you know, it's a working class movement. You know, there were many people or some people who said at the, out, at the uh, during period of these events, oh, the working class should have occupied their workplaces. And again, I'd say, all right, for keyboard agitators around the world, occupying nothing but the swivel chairs at their computer desks, the solution is easy, occupy your factories. But Greece, let's look again, particularly in Greece, but it's the same will apply uh, uh, increasingly in Britain and most of the countries of Europe. Greece has the highest rate of unemployment, the highest rate of self-employment, and the lowest average concentration of employment in Europe. The lowest proportion of companies with over 250 employees, and even those are scattered in local branches. A quarter of Greek workers are unemployed, one third are self-employed, and most of the rest are scattered in small workshops. So where are these unemployed job seekers, self-employed tradespeople and labourers scattered in small scale workshops meant to occupy? You say, you know, they, they didn't move as a class and that demonstrations aren't revolutions. Well, I, uh, I would take a different view of that. It was the streets and the squares which were the site of the occupations. And that's an international phenomenon from 
Tiananmen Square in Beijing, to Winchester Square in Prague, to Tahrir Square in Cairo, to Puerto del Sol in Madrid and Plaza de Catalunya in Barcelona, Causeway Bay in Hong Kong, all these public spaces of countries on every continent in the last three years, uh, for instance, were, were, you know, were the site of mounting protests. And all the more so that applies to St. Douglas Square in Athens, which was occupied at times by half a million people and was a site of permanent occupation for months on end. And the reclamation of public spaces are part and a key part of the growing revolution. The mass of humanity crowding into them drew alongside the workers, the youth with their aspirations to a future denied them by capitalism, the students, the unemployed, the pensioners, the self-employed, the entrepreneurs, the veterans, the pensioners, and by the way, of some significance, the migrants and refugees. And that's the appropriate site of struggle in the modern era of globalization and the internet. And by the way, they did more than just stand there. Alongside this expression of rising consciousness came a creative outpouring of autonomous self-organization. They improvised ingenious strategies for survival, elements of an alternative solidarity economy were springing up, combining age-old community traditions of bartering goods and services with interactive networking systems largely bypassing monetary transactions. In the Athens Time Bank, people exchange credits for measures for services measured by hours of working time. Communes were established, alternative local currencies were devised, parallel markets were set up, self-help institutions were formed. In some localities, the unemployed were registered and donated four hours mutual service per week for their upkeep. So in a way, the embryo of a new society was germinating uh, in the course of these occupations. And the government, what the government should have done, the, the Syriza, of course, completely failed and they completely deluded themselves that they would be able to somehow negotiate some way out of the impasse. What they should have done is impose capital controls, nationalize the banks, announce an immediate default on the debt, take over all the companies that were laying off workers or withholding their wages, appealing directly to the workers of Europe and the world for solidarity and support. But if I can just uh, add, it was not the working class that fell short of those tasks. In an opinion poll in the course of these events, 33% of the, of the population voted in so many words for revolution. 35% of the population had personally participated in street protests. More than a third of the population had personally been on the streets fighting for their cause. From 2011 to 2015, general strikes were called on average every six weeks. On uh, 5th of March 2010, half a million marched uh, in the first general strike. Public squares occupied, government ministries, public buildings occupied. Offices of the Electric Electricity Corporation were occupied to prevent disconnections of defaulting households. When there was a threat to shut down the Public Broadcasting Corporation, its employees occupied its studios and launched an innovative and creative democratic broadcasting services, a service. Demonstrators set up gallows on St. Dunbar Square outside the Parliament building. Improvised slogans were shouted and inscribed on their banners. And by the way, these angry, witty, revolutionary slogans were written not just in Greek, but in English, Spanish, French, Italian, and German, in a conscious and explicit appeal to the workers in those countries to follow suit and to defy their bankers and their capitalists too. And finally, look at the ref referendum of July 2015. Of course, it was a trick by the Syriza government. They sought to evade responsibility for their coming betrayal by asking the Greek people to provide it with an alibi by placing the onus of decision on them. But look what happened. By a margin of almost two to one, the Greek people cried no. 61.3% defied the Troika's blackmail. Practically every single demographic, demographic category voted no. People at every single level of income, 85% of young people, but also between 60 and 72% of every other age group, except for the over 65s. And even there, 48% of uh, pensioners voted no. And when um, that very night, 
Tsipras confided in Varoufakis his intention to ignore the results and to capitulate, he admitted that the one thing that was motivating him was fear that he personally would end up in front of a firing squad. He said so in so many words. And what an insult to the hundreds of thousands of partisans who had given their lives to single-handedly overthrow the Nazi occupation and the hundreds of workers who were gunned down as they stormed the Nazi labor ministry and forced them to withdraw their policy of enlisting them as slaves, or the students of the Polytechnic in 1973 who defied the bullets of the colonel's dictatorship. But um, where do we go from here? Syriza, I quite agree with, uh, with uh, Anthony. Syriza was almost an accidental phenomenon, which was just an outgrowth of this popular movement. Uh, it sprang from nothing, but even Pasok had sprung from nothing. It came overnight it, with the downfall of the, um, of the uh, colonel's regime in 1974. Uh, there is a, a tradition of spontaneity in, in Greece, and I think we will see new formations and new uh, movements of defiance in the, uh, in the years that are coming. Thanks, comrades. Thank, thank you, Roger. Well, I, I see David's got his hand up. I'm just going to read out a question that came up on the chat because um, uh, th th this may provoke further discussion. Apologies, multitasking, so can't, this, is, this comes from Ian. I'm multitasking, so can't come in and ask a question live, but I wanted to ask what Greek and other comrades make of Varoufakis and his new party, the only left Syriza force to break through into parliament at the last election, I think Anthony might have mentioned it as, as a centre left, though I might have misheard. In any case, I wouldn't agree. I'd see it as a radical left, at least as much as Syriza itself. Varoufakis split from Tsipras clearly to his left, and after years of implementing austerity in government, surely the Tsipras group is finished as a vehicle for radical change. So that's a question that may um, stimulate some thinking amongst other comrades. Um, go back and refer to it if you um, if you didn't catch everything I said. Uh, it's over to you, David. Uh, comrades, uh, I was a little uh, reluctant to come in um, and uh, you know ha with a series of questions, but but let me uh, you know put these. Um, I if I heard correctly. Um, I heard Anthony say that the Marxists were constrained by the limits of European capitalism, and that that was a decisive factor. Um, you know, let me just reflect on that. I put it as a question, but let me just reflect if that uh, was the case. And the other point, you know, which uh, some somewhat uh, aroused my, my, my curiosity uh, was this uh, question that it was just an explosion, you know, not a socialist uh, movement. Um, you know, was that really just the character, you know, of the huge upsurge uh, which led a left party into power with a, with a, a large majority? You know, let me just uh, raise questions those questions and then make some comments. I think that, um, you know, the introduction was, you know, raised some really important points, although I, I think we might have needed some more familiarity with all the chronology of events because there's so many things happen. And Roger did a marvelous job in terms of pulling together, you know, all the variety and the depth, you know, of that movement and what a challenge it posed. But what we have seen, if I, you know, from my perspective from a distance, is a relatively small European nation standing up against you know, the dominant powers of Europe and attempting to avoid an austerity program and to offer some alternative uh, to austerity, uh, to mass unemployment, and in a sense to the destruction of a nation. And I think what I've read about Greece in the period since the imposition of the austerity that the European capitalists wanted is that there's been a flight of the youth from the country. The population is in, in decline. 
just about every indicator of financial health, for instance, the ability to pay back debts, uh, has only been made uh, possible by the extension of further loans. Uh, and so it's not as though capitalism has intervened and been able to stabilize and revitalize, you know, the small part of capitalism in, in Greece. It seems as though it's, it's uh, a nation of walking wounded, uh, of, of youth which are in despair, of older generation which have given up uh, and, and not known what to do. And yet there has been a tremendous still a, a spirit uh, among uh, Greek people, if I could you know, put it at times, despite all the horrific uh, pressures that are on Greece at the moment, with the intrusion and, and, and having to accept uh, you know, a, a large number of refugees, which raises all the tensions you know, of, you know, in that population, of actually having somewhat on, on the ground, somewhat developed a, a, a policy which has been able to absorb that. Uh, and it, in a sense, it's, it's now become an offshore place, you know, for the European uh, major powers, you know, to hold immigrants there so that they don't advance further uh, into, into Germany uh, or into, well, not into Britain because that's now, you know, out of the EU, but to all other parts and to France itself. Uh, and, and so it's, it's had this it's, it's terrible crushing. And yet, the, in a sense, the nation, to look at it, you know, a, a abstracting from some of the class perspective, has is, is still retained a certain capacity, despite, you know, the devastation that has been wrecked on the, on the people, the working people, uh, and, you know, and, and, it's, and those possibilities. And I just want to look at, you know, at some, some issues. Is it possible to break out of the bounds of capitalism? I think it's right in a sense to say that Marxists were constrained. Well, of course, we're all constrained by capitalism. But is it possible to, to break out of, of, of those uh, constraints by one way or the other? And I don't want to go into this, to the, the points about refuse, you know, that the feeling of the people was that they couldn't reject the euro uh, when that was posed, uh, and so forth and so forth. And the fact that Syria, Sarizia so in the end just uh, stood down and implemented, despite the mandate uh, to confront and to, and to persist, actually uh, ended up uh, standing down. And I do think that it's possible to, to go beyond the limits. And uh, first of all, I quote uh, a quote from someone who's no Marxist, and that is from Keynes. And Keynes was once asked, has anyone actually carried out your program? And he said, no. Because no party, no government has actually had the courage to do it. In other words, the basic ideas of the really fundamental restructuring of capitalism, which he had been proposed, was, was uh, not carried out for political reasons, not for economic reasons. Now, in other words, it was possible to go beyond the constraints of capitalism and then to be able to persist. And just, just one, I, I wondered, uh, maybe another question to raise is if there had been a continued defiance of European capitalism, you know, what would have happened? Well, there could have been economic crisis. On the other hand, the European capitalists could not have had a permanent crisis on their frontier as in Greece, and then the, the, the rise of the crisis in Turkey and and throughout the, uh, the whole uh, Middle East. And they would have had to make concessions. Just look what's happened now. The European Union has had to extend credit way beyond the credit that was extended to Greece under COVID conditions. It's not as though it wasn't possible. It's, it, partly, it is a political question. Was it possible to unify the left so that the stance, the defiance of the people could be translated into a concrete policy and continued defiance to force the uh, European capitalists to offer concessions. May, it wouldn't be a transformation, wouldn't be a socialist revolution, but it would have been a huge victory uh, for the uh, is, was it not? Was it possible for the left to have united? Or is the left so fragmented that even on a basis of a 61% majority, the left couldn't unite in, uh, behind that uh, behind that majority. In other words, is it a, is it that a political question 
you know, what we've uh, got, you know, to, to, to confront. Uh, you know, I, I just leave that question open and I look forward to some answers. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Dave. Next speaker in the discussion is Aman. Thank you. Um, just just uh, very briefly, um, I think the issue of what happened in Greece uh, is was far beyond what really was uh, mentioned in terms of Greece. And I think the expectation and the work that was taking place uh, had repercussions everywhere. Uh, the idea was that uh, there is um, one country, in this case Greece, who was standing up against the uh, real changes and austerity. And at the time, and I think it was literally the only place that we could say on such a mass scale, that was a standing up to the austerity measures and was saying that it is not the case that the government of the Greece, whatever it was, um, could actually accept uh, this austerity and people came out. So from that point of view, I think it was a mass struggle. And I think working class was and part and parcel of that. Without the working class in there, it would have been impossible to actually organize or to actually see such an event. So from that point of view, I think the role of the working class in Greece was obvious. Uh, the bourgeoisie wasn't going to actually say no to it. So it was literally mass from below. That, that was one point. Second point was, uh, I think the idea of the European Union and the bourgeoisie in Greece was definitely one of not giving up to the protests that was taking place. And I think they did it intentionally. Had the European Union at the time uh, given in, uh, then I think they were not being able to actually stand up against the other protests which would have taken place afterwards. So it was obvious that everything that they had in the um, arsenal, they would throw it at the Greece people. Um, so therefore, it, it was expected that the Greeks would be uh, subjected to such a harsh condition. Given that, I think it was paramount to recognize that the left could have done more, I think, in terms of what uh, was just mentioned uh, from what David was saying, that there was room to actually form something uh, as a barricade against the attack of the bourgeoisie. That, that was definitely, I think, one of the main issues on the agenda for the Greek left and the working class in that case. I think the working class, I think, to a large extent, uh, is not, as uh, Roger did say, is not just the people who are wearing the greasy overalls, it is, is spread across the whole country. So the actual protest that was taking place was on such a massive scale. So the question that was always raised is, how much could the left uh, stand up and recognize the massive attack that was taking place, not from the point of view of different political agendas, but from the point of view of being able to stand up to the bourgeoisie at the time. Uh, it's, very, it's very, very clear that that did not materialize as much as it could have had in order to be able to actually withstand it. I think that that part of it is definitely correct. But there is one issue which I just wanted to mention, and that is uh, it's very different to look at the whole scenario afterwards. And I think that is important to what could have taken place at the time while everything was going on. I think afterwards we can see what the bourgeoisie did. I can see afterwards we can see variety of issues that have raised and therefore afterwards we could start picking up what could have been done or who's to be blamed or whatever. But at the time, I think it was clear, everybody could see, irrespective of how that movement was led, there was one thing definite, the mass protest from below was saying that they do not what is actually being forced upon them. And I think in Europe at the time, that was a major big change and everybody could see that uh, occurring. So the question is not whether they actually succeeded completely or not, but the question is how they could have succeeded. And I think that at the time was a big issue and uh, that's what the left needed to have answered. And that's it, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Aman. I don't see any hand up. With that in mind, I'm going to make a short contribution from the chair. Um, I think um, what happened after 2015 is also quite illuminating in our understanding 
of what's happening in Greece, because there's no doubt, I think every comrade agrees here, that 2015 was a big setback, a big defeat. And yet the struggle in Greece against austerity and against the establishment still continues. It continues on the streets and it continues in the universities. Three years ago, in 2018, there was a general strike against austerity. May not have been quite such a big strike as the 42 that Roger mentioned, but nevertheless, the working class is still alive, is still fighting back. Greek, trans Greek workers this year um, struck against labor reforms. All transport stopped, fer ferries, docks and ports all stopped. And this was over um, changes in, in, in the right of employers to force workers to work longer hours. Um, uh, there were 10,000 people in a rally outside parliament. Um, there have been protests of health service workers. There, there have been um, demonstrations against the um, intervention of police in, uh, in the universe or, or, or against, the, against legislation that would have allowed police to come back into the universities, which is something that um, students are, are, are highly opposed to. Um, protests in Athens against police killings of a 20 year old uh, Roma man um, by, by the infamous uh, police motorcycle units who operate apparently kind of out of out of any control of other sections of the police force, out of any judicial control. Um, there have been protests of people against the closure of the Department of the Fire Brigade that deal with forest fires, particularly in the light of the fact that forest fires are greatly increasing due, due to climate change. So all, all of these indicate that bubbling underneath the surf, surface of Greek society, even though there was a huge step, setback in 2015, there are still opportunities for the movement to rebuild. And the, the last thing I, I, I want to say in, in kind of response to some of the things that, that other comrades have said, a confrontation in 2015 or a confrontation now with the European central banks would lead to huge questions being posed for the whole of the European working class. It would lead to a challenge of the institutions of power. It, it, I mean, it, it, it would have been a defiance against the whole of European capitalism, and it would, it would have shifted politics out of the realm of parliamentary um, decisions, you know, that, 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 that in, in order for the working class of Europe, the stalemate that it's in, it, we, we have a working class generally across Europe who would like to oppose austerity, but can't see a way of doing it. In order to overcome that, that um, blockage, we have to have a movement that is mature enough to move beyond parliamentary forms of government, to, to look to solutions like the Paris Commune, where representatives are immediately recallable by the people who elected them, where representatives receive no higher wages than the average wages of the people that they represent, so that there's not a gap between the people and those who are trying to represent the people, as some Anthony alluded to, you know, so that the, 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 the people and those who are representing them are are unified in one movement with one with one set of, of standards in their lives and so on. That that has to be part of the movement that will emerge from the crisis that um, that is developing in European politics at the moment. That's it from me. I'm turning the meeting back for comrades who would like to put their hands up to speak. This doesn't have to be a definitive conclusion to the meeting because um, normally our meetings run for about two hours. So if you would like to take a bit of time now, Anthony, responding right. to some of the points that have been made, and we may get the chance then to throw this back open to the floor of the meeting. Over to you, Anthony. Right. Firstly, uh, yeah, Thermos, I didn't say that uh, Pasov was finished in the 90s actually said Pasov was abandoned in the 90s by the revolutionary left, and it was. And actually, if Pasov wasn't abandoned, abandoned by the Marxist left, if they had stayed in there, created, the, created 
a situation where they propagated, educated, uh, created the positions uh, of power within PASO by 2011, when things, or 2009 with the Pandreo, the new Pandreo government took over, then we could have had a different situation. As it was, as that the, that the left the Marxists were nowhere involved in actual the, in, in the proper party of the working class, in 2011, PASOK was used as a way, as a means to deliver the hand of the European ruling class. And in left, the working class, the working class partyless. Now, individual stories are very nice and very encountered and very, uh, it's very nice to hear, but to give individual stories, project them in general, uh, a general characterization of, 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 uh, of, the, of the movement is, is problematic. Whatever the individual stories is, the movement was middle class. Now, when Samaras, the right wing Samaras government would fire 100,000 public servants, the next day would be no support by the same people that were swearing and shouting in front of the parliament. When Samaras shut down in one day, the TV, the, the, the state TV station and the state radio, which you probably some of you, especially in Britain, because the BBC was very much involved in this, in opposing this, some of you British uh, comrades might uh, remember, no support came from the same people that were shouting and screaming in, uh, in, the, in the squares. So we must be very, very careful in not confusing class movement and middle class movement. There cannot be a revolution or revolt, protest to revolution. We cannot have a revolution and the revolution be dependent on whether a middle class petty bourgeois uh, political leadership will actually bring it into conclusion or its conclusion is dependent on the middle class. That cannot be revolution. Revolution means class, class movement, class consciousness, revolutionary consciousness. And every time, of that consciousness, the development of that consciousness is dependent on the institutions that the working class has built. Economic consciousness, the unions. Political consciousness, mass party. Um, revolutionary consciousness, institutions that challenge the state, that create duality of power. Did we have that? Of course not, by far. A unified movement of the working class. No union came out in support of the other union. It actually allowed each union allowed the other to see whether they would take get the snake get the, the wood out of the fire. When the when the teachers moved in May 2013, they actually under the threat of uh, imprisonment, they asked they asked the National Federation of Public Workers to go out in a, in a, in, a, in a national strike at the same day their strike would, would start. Instead of that. The national, the national, the, the, the federation went for called for one day general, uh, general strike three days before, leaving them, abandoning them on their own against the, the, the threat of uh, imprisonment. Two days before the strike, the general federation of private workers signed a new deal with cuts, uh, lack of, you know, uh, um, taking away of benefits at, uh, and at the negotiation table. And one of the major um, employees association didn't even take part in negotiations. That's how dismissed of the labor movement and its ability to galvanize the working class into the streets. That's how weak the labor movement was because if it wasn't, we weren't being the situation we are here. And that's the problem. Um, now, there is, Pasov is not Syriza. In eight, I don't remember when it was, 8182, you can YouTube it. When, when Papandreou spoke in Thessaloniki, there were 2 million people in the street. 2 million people when the, the, the population of Greece were about 9 million. In 2014, Syriza had 30,000 membership. This year, New Democracy in its internal elections had the presentation of 130,000 people. If you, have, if you want a mass party right now in Greece is New Democracy. Not Syriza, not Pasok, obviously. Pasok doesn't even exist at this time. That's how lack of participation, uh, how much lack of participation is evident in Greek politics right now. And Syriza did at one, at never in, 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 its, in its time between 2013, 2015, 
did it ask for mass participation to take place within its ranks? Why? Because it's very much well, well known that mass part, working class participation would push the argument to, 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 to issues that the leadership did not want to touch. The Marxist organizations inside Syria and the factions did, did not want, in effect, mass participation. Why? Because mass participation of the working class in a party would dismiss their, 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 their sectarian organizations. They push them away, and, but all they wanted was organizational power within a small uh, structure, political structure, where it could allow them access to governmental power. So we, we it's all very nice and nice, you know, romantic, talking about romantically about the period. But the reality of the thing is, what movement, and it wasn't, not in the way that the revolutionary class movement we're talking about. The workers moved under the banners of middle class uh, positions, asking for bourgeois democracy to deliver reforms. But here's the thing about reforms. Reforms are well and good, but if reforms cannot be defended by the working class, they are meaningless. Because whatever reforms series are brought, new democracy right now within the first two months of its uh, establishment in power, rip them apart without the working class being able to do that. The strike, the general strike that Ed referred to, Roger, the general strike that Ed referred to was, it was a farce. Uh, in, in, in first place, we we're talking about a month ago, two months ago, with, with labor reform. In the first place, the general, the, the general federation of, the, of private uh, unions, private workers, didn't even want to go into general strike. So they, they were forced into, into calling on one day general strike, and that was it. The vote took, took place, it was voted in. What was Syriza's call? And I was in meetings in Syriza with MPs from Syriza. You know what were their call? Their call was, let's make sure we are voted in two years. That was the revolutionary call. And that was the mentality back in 2015. Roger, you, I'm sure you, you speak again. That was the mentality in 2015. All it's needed is for the working class to vote Syriza and all will be good. Of course, we as Marxists know that's not the case. We as Marxists are supposed to expose reformism, expose the philosophy, it's philosophy expose the misdirection it, uh, it, it provides, and populism, obviously, not attached to it in the way that Marxist left, Greek Marxist left, attached to populism in Syria. And once, the, and once obviously, you got exposed for what it was, they left Syria, and now they have, uh, they have gone to other middle class uh, uh, alliances. We must understand that mass workers' parties are led by, mid, by the middle class. That doesn't mean the quest, that doesn't mean we need to go into a quest for new parties and new again. The reality is that within the, the parameters of bourgeois okay. democracy, you're going to have a leadership, middle class leadership. It is the unification of the working class into a single part that is needed, where it will put forward the discussion of what next. I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Anthony. Um, Larry has his hand up. Larry Hyatt, would you like to come in, Larry? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I've been following the, uh, the contribution by comrades on a number of fronts, and it occurs to me that the, the debate seems to resolve, resolve around the, the middle class um, elements that purport to represent the working class. And the, work, the middle class always look up to resolve, look up to the state to resolve the crisis um, uh, that is confronting the, the working class. There seems to be a lack of democratic Republican socialist groups at street level uh, to resolve these um, revolutionary problems. Uh, the weakness of the labour movement to organise um, defiance at street level uh, with street level demands, like starting with local strike committees as local demands progress to national level. And it's, it's true that um, the middle class always try to manipulate 
the labor movement. We see it in this country as well, the intellectual uh, resistance to the witch hunts in the Labour Party are all being led by middle class organisations which don't have, in my opinion, a, a, a foundation of working class solidarity to it. It's uh, it, they're, they're side issues on the stage of class struggle and we don't seem to be able to organise ourselves in this country or, or internationally uh, on the basis of um, community defence um, and resistance. Um, this is the this is the problem I seem to to come across. Even the strikes that uh, that I've been involved with is that um, trying to to generate the enthusiasm of working people to defend and and take responsibility for their for their own actions and defence of their demands. Um, these are the things that uh, I think that we we need to debate and understand that uh, within the Workers International Network. And I do believe that the networking um, uh, system, so especially that's come to the fore since the pandemic and Zoom meetings, is, a, is an instrument that we don't seem to be uh, grasping to its full extent. And thank you very much. Thank you, Larry. Someone on Trinity's iPad wants to come in anyway. So over to you, Trinity's iPad. Hi, uh, cheers, it's Dominic. Uh, I'm a bit confused by Anthony's last comment because one of the things he said was that the trade union leaders were forced to participate in a strike. And at the same time, he was saying the workers were passive or weren't, weren't doing anything. Well, I would assume it was the workers in that particular federation of unions or that union that forced the leadership to act because I can't see any for any other force in society actually forcing them to take strike action. So it seems to contradict to an extent what he was saying in his in the previous in this contribution is just that. So I, I'd like an, an answer to who who forced them. Thank you, Dominic. Um, okay, uh, Themos, it's over to you. Uh, sorry, Ed, can I answer that question? So, so please, please do, please do. Uh, yeah. Because I kind of talked about it very fast. So uh, the the Labour Centre, the, the Labour Centre of Athens, uh, uh, called for a general strike, and the public sector, the Federation of Public Sector Workers, called for a general strike on the day that they would vote for the labour reforms. Initially, the trade, the Federation for Private Workers was, did not really uh, want to go, but they actually were forced by the Labour Centre of Athens and uh, the Federation of, uh, of Public Workers, not by, 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 by the membership, uh, by the working class itself. Um, uh, to, to, to just to make, to, uh, I'd like to, make, to, to, to give you a picture. On the day of the strike, one of the biggest unions involved in the labor uh, section of Athens, in the what is it called, the labor center of Athens, is that of uh, workers in in workers, coffee shop workers, supermarket workers, retail workers. You understand what I mean? None of these places were shut; they were all open. Why? Because there is lack of membership. The strike action is all well and fine, but in order to have the right to strike, you have to participate first in the unions. And union participation is at, as you very well know, because it's a phenomenon across uh, countries, it's at its lowest point because of the manner bureaucracies and uh, the political system has used the unions. So it's, you know, it's all well and fine to hear about general strikes, but we have to see, and you know, and striking uh, unions. But we have to see beyond the titles. We have to see, be, uh, the, uh, you know, their impact. And their impact was none. And it, and in being none, it it creates even more problems because it weakens even more uh, the labor uh, movement. Obviously, because it it exposes its inability to uh, mobilize uh, workers. 
Okay, thank you, Anthony. Um, Themos, I'm sorry I kind of um, cut you out there at the last minute, but it's your turn now. No, it's fine. Uh, the only thing I want to uh, to discuss a bit is this question of for the, the characterization of the movement as a middle class movement and not a working class movement. Uh, not because I disagree uh, uh, in essence with, uh, with, what, uh, with what Anthony says, but uh, I would go uh, probably to, a, to the extreme of saying that uh, no revolution is a pure working class revolution. I mean, if we, see, if we see any revolution, any movement, it started as a middle class movement. I mean, the Russian Revolution wasn't the, uh, wasn't the working class movement. It developed into it, and if it wasn't for the Bolsheviks, it would end in disaster much earlier than it did. Uh, the, the, if we go to 1916 in, in Ireland, we discussed, it was discussed at the time whether uh, Connolly was right in uh, participating in the, in the Easter Rising. And it, it has been discussed. It wasn't the working class revolution again. Any revolution, it, the Arab Spring was not a working class revolution in this sense. It was a middle class and more general revolution. It ended where it ended. The same thing, we can say, I think, about Greece. And this is not a bad thing. The weather is, how do you participate in this? What I agree with Anthony, there wasn't a, a, a working class leadership with, uh, with, uh, with, the, with, the, with the Marxist perspective, uh, which would help it, help it to intervene consciously in this revolution and, and make sure that this cause was, uh, was safeguarded. But, uh, uh, we shouldn't get bogged down in characterization. What, whether it was the one or the other, it's a matter of how we see things and how, how, our, how we treat our concepts. And I think the important thing is to see, and I think there is, we should be, we should be, uh, we should discuss this much more, is what happened in the first half of 1915, of, of 2015. And, uh, I, I, I will probably uh, be, uh, uh, sound very, very strange in saying that Syriza's policies discussing with the, with the European, with the, with the European Union for, uh, for obtaining uh, a, an agreement was not wrong. It was the correct revolutionary path, whether the, the leadership realized it or not because Greece could not win by itself. Greece would, uh, would win if the whole working class movement in Europe won, if Europe changed. And these discussions helped a lot to raise the consciousness of the working class both in Greece and in Europe. Of course, it had to be followed not by capitulation, but by, uh, by a break with the European, uh, with the European elite completely after the referendum. There was the crunch. And that, I think, is the, uh, is the important failure of Syriza uh, at that time. Not the negotiations, not, the, the, not seeking a compromise with the, with the, European, with the, with the Europeans, which it could never get any. Thank you, Themos. Um, we have Steve Forrest with his hand up. Please come in, Steve. Thank you very much. Uh, just to come in on really mainly that point of uh, Femos there. I mean, uh, Femos, I think there's probably one for another discussion in and of itself, perhaps, you know, the characterization of the Russian Revolution. But I happen to just be read, read, uh, reading for the first time a, a quite interesting work. I um, can't remember the author off the top of my head, but it was recommended to me based on some more up-to-date sources, but it doesn't really change anything we know. But I, I don't think you can characterize the Russian Revolution to start as a middle-class revolution. I mean, it, it, it clearly, you know, on the, what we now refer to as International Women's Day, which, you know, in the new calendar is the 8th of March, 1917. It was, it was, a, it was a mass uprising of the working class of Petrograd. 90,000 people, workers on the streets, women and men, you know, the first revolution took place under the belly of the Cossack horse, right? When the, the Cossack soldiers elect the women workers, the women strikers, 
begin the march on the Torre Palace, is a classical revolutionary movement. And, and they were ordered by the Tsar's army to go home and stay home. Yet they came out the next day. They came out and they picketed out in the Vyborg district and in other districts of Petrograd, they picketed out other working class people in factories across Petrograd. It then spread to Moscow. It is a classic revolution. Perhaps October is not the classic revolution. We're not interested in the, 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 non, the nonsense of a coup, but it, it, it's not necessarily the classic revolution, but February is the classic revolution. October is the classic revolution in the sense that the working class was already controlled and, and organized through the Soviets. Roger talks about squares, the battle in Tahrir Square. I don't really get the one back to Yanaman, but, but the Tahrir Square and uh, you know, e e Egypt and even the Corbyn movement. Again, I don't think it's necessarily the discussion for Corbyn speaks to 300 activists on a seaside beach in the north of England. Um, but I, 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 I can see Roger nodding his head there, but I think the reality is, you know, in relation to the, the squares, what was the reaction? of the workers in Petrograd on the March the 18th, 1917. It was to reform the Soviets of 1905. They went home that night, they didn't occupy the square. They went home that night and they began the process of reforming the Soviet, which was a dual power. First to the Tsar, and then when the Tsar collapsed to the Kerensky government. And from there came the Russian revolution. Dual power through the Soviets, organized working class power, organized from the boot, from the bottom up. Trotsky is a marvelous passage in the history of the Russian Revolution, where Trotsky talks about who led the February Revolution, because all the range of Bolshevik leaders were out of the country, including Trotsky. And no, they didn't lead it. It was led from the streets up by the working class of Petrograd who formed the Soviets that challenged state power. It's a working class movement that challenged state power. That is not what you saw in Greece. That's not what you saw in Tahrir Square. It is not, Roger, what you saw. If it is, with all due respect, what you saw, you are not seeing what actually took place. And I believe the problem is if we base ourselves on something that didn't take place because we want it to be that way, we can never actually plot a proper way forward. And I believe ultimately that's the real skill of Lenin and the Bolsheviks, because they were able to see the role of events and the path of events through a revolutionary movement. And I would urge you all, I think and one of the best points Anthony made was this comparison with, I would urge you all tonight to flick on or whatever daylight time it is, to flick on YouTube uh, and look up pa uh, Papandreou and Saloniki, whatever you say, however you say that, in 1981. It's awe inspiring. They, they, they take the camera out and they, they take it down the seafront and every single space is packed that's a country on the verge of revolution, not a demonstration of 30,000 for Sarita or even in the square. And I'll just finish on this. In 1980, 1994, there was a mass, there was a, a, a mass anger against the IRA when they broke the ceasefire with the bomb in the city of London, in Belfast in particular, in the north of Ireland. There was mass anger to the, to the IRA breaking that ceasefire because people wanted peace. They had enough, they wanted peace. And there was a, there was a, a demand for a general strike in the north of Ireland to, 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 to ensure that, that the workers had their say. What did they do? The, the trade union leaderships allowed the workers to go out on strike for 15 minutes in their tea break, nothing to the peace process, nothing to the anger of the working class in the north of Ireland, but it allowed them to let off steam because without the when they've let off steam, they've got nowhere else to take that anger. That's what happens with these general strikes in Greece, France, and Italy, Spain, etc. General strike is a tool of allowing the workers to let off steam. In most cases, thank you very much. Okay, hey, thank you, Steve. Roger might want to respond to some of what's been said. I, I just want to say, I mean, I think this is the beginning of a discussion. I, um, I disagree with uh, a lot of what um, Steve just said, but I don't want to take them, them up now because it was on so many different issues on uh, on uh, Ireland and what happened in 1981 and uh, I can't remember what other, you know, Tahrir Square and so on. The Russian but Revolution. I just want to say, I just want to say one thing. Um, 
which I think sums up what the difference is that uh, between what I'm saying and other comrades are saying and what um, Anthony is saying. We're not, uh, we don't have a difference about the role of Sarita. Um, Anthony, all your denunciations, Sarita, I'm in complete agreement with. Uh, that's not something I'm saying uh, ex post facto. Uh, ex post facto. Uh, I mean, as you know, I studied Greece quite thoroughly and I wrote a book in 2016 about it. And you'll see the, the whole content of my book is to show precisely how Syriza failed to live up to the revolution that was in, uh, in uh, progress. Um, that is not the point between us. All your denunciations of Syriza, I endorse 100%, 1000%. But what you are doing, or what you, what you were doing in your opening, was writing off the movement of the working class, the revolutionary movement of the working class. So I still insist, it's not a question of, uh, it's, it's not a question of just um, episodic little uh, demonstrations or something. Half a million people, occupied uh, St. Douglas Square. St. Douglas Square was occupied day and night for months on end. The slogans I've quoted, or you can see them in more detail uh, in, uh, in the stuff that I've written. The, um, the, it, it, they were revolutionary slogans. It was a revolutionary will. It was, uh, Syriza in fact played no part in that movement in the whole of the uprising between 2010 and 2015. They were the afterthought. They were swept to power at the end for want of any alternative. And uh, they had no idea what to do with the power when they had it. And as we know, they um, partly through confusion and partly through outright treachery, as, uh, as I quoted uh, what um, Tsipras said on the night of the, when the referendum results came, when he said the only reason why he wasn't going to carry through the defiance of the uh, bankers that was mandated to them by two thirds scared for his own personal neck. He was afraid that he would be put before a firing squad. That is treachery. That is the definition of treachery. But that the the denunciation of Syriza is one thing, but to to um, rubbish the um, the movement of the working class for five years in the previous uh, period before that, with 42 general strikes. Yes, you're right, they were letting off steam. But look what a head of steam must have been built up that they that the uh, that the trade union leaders felt they had 42 times to, um, to, um, to let off that steam. There was a huge revolutionary movement, as I say. 35% of the population physically went out on the streets. The equivalent in Britain would be 20 million people came out onto the streets. One third of the population said in so many words when they were faced with the question in an opinion poll, they said, we want revolution. A third of the population. That is something you can't just dismiss. It was not a middle-class movement. That's just ridiculous to say that, quite honestly. Uh, that's something, it's something that we should take heart from, we should take inspiration from, and above all, we must learn from to show what the potential of the working class is, but to see also how we need the, the absolute necessity of, spare, of preparing so that there's a, um, a well-founded leadership at the head of that movement and not just another Syriza uh, which would dissipate the, the movement that is coming, whether in Greece, whether in Britain or in any other country. And that's what we're doing. That's why we have win. That's why we are discussing all these um, revolutions that are sweeping the world at the present time. It's in order to clarify the ideas by which that huge movement, that real revolutionary movement of the working masses, of how that can be actually um, uh, properly and properly harnessed so that it leads to some actual change in the lives of the population. So uh, I'll leave it at that. So I thank Anthony for a very stimulating and lively uh, debate, and I'm sure this is not the end of the debate. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Roger. Okay, Anthony, um, I think we're coming towards the end of the meeting. Um, the, there's about 10 minutes of time and the last word can go with you because you're the introductory speaker as well. So would you like to reply to what's been said, please? Yeah, okay. Um, are we saying here that a revolution, a revolutionary movement can be defined by the way 
it develops through bourgeois democracy. No. Surely that cannot be a revolutionary movement. Of course. But, but the fact is that the way that those demonstrations took place, they could only be defined and, uh, and, uh, and uh, defined through a result in bourgeois democratic elections. And there is another thing. Syriza wasn't involved in those demonstrations, not because it couldn't, it tried to. Every time a political party would try to go to get involved in those demonstrations, they were booed out, booed away, because the main nature, culture of those demonstrations was apolitical. It was a, 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 a participation, it was, not, it was apathetic towards political participation. It was, uh, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was actually, it had a vindictive kind of uh, attitude towards the establishment to the extent that a lot of the, of, the, of, the, of the part of that movement actually found voice in the fascists because the fascists were involved in, in those squares. Let's not forget that the, the, the Golden Dawn was in there. Anarchists was, were in there. The Golden Dawn were in there. Later on, under Syriza, uh, 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 while Syriza was in government, people returned to the squares and we found new democracy MPs uh, leading, uh, the, leading the, the demonstrations then. So we, can, so we can bring up numbers, but it doesn't mean a unified, uh, a unified movement. Why wasn't a working class movement? Because a working class moved through its, its institutions. When it goes into the streets, it goes to challenge the state. It does not go into the streets just to beg for mercy and, uh, and reforms by the, 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 the establishment. What were the institutions that the working class, like Steve uh, spoke about Soviets? I'm not going to call about Soviets, but even a mass party through which it would exert power towards the political establishment. Again, it's very problematic to confuse the move, uh, movements, class movement, revolutionary movements. Revolt, protest, yes. Revolution, no. I'm not going to leave it at that. Okay, thank you very much, Anthony. Um, I'd like to thank all the comrades who've spoken in this meeting, which I think illustrates very, the meeting tonight illustrates very well what Wynne is trying to do. We are trying to create a genuinely diverse approach to understanding what is happening in the movement today with a variety of different points of view having equal say in, um, in, in a democratic debate. So and, I'm, I'm and sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, can I say something? Sorry to interrupt you. Please do. Uh, first of all, before, because we're going to close the meeting, uh, uh, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, thank you for Roger for inviting him here, even though he knows the differences that we have and actually bringing someone uh, here with a different uh, perspective, as you just explained, despite the, you know, and have to have a broad discussion about things that we may not, of course, agree. So thank you for, uh, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you. You're, you're very welcome, Anthony. Thank, thank you for coming and making your, your stimulating contribution. Um, I, I don't think I have anything more to say, but I would like to just pass over to Roger, who will tell us um, about what the plans are for the next meeting of WIN. Okay, can you hear me? We've got you now, yes. Okay, uh, right. Well, in all of these discussions, we, are, we always uh, try to emphasize the revolutionary nature of the period and, the, uh, and draw attention to the huge movement that is sweeping the world uh, uh, as we speak. But um, of course, we've always said as well, that's one side of the picture. There is a huge polarization taking place in society. There's a big movement of, uh, of the working class and of the oppressed strata of the population uh, in every continent. But there is also on the ruling, on the side of the ruling class, more and more there's the emergence of extreme, uh, extremely repressive, dangerous, racist, uh, and uh, even sometimes fascist uh, organizations and, uh, and counter movements from the ruling class. And uh, we want to examine the danger to what extent 
they pose an immediate threat or an immediate danger to the movements of the working class. So in other words, what is the threat of reaction uh, today? Uh, and um, Finn Gini, who's here now, is going to be uh, a discussion. We're expecting um, that comrades from all over the world will participate in that, will give um, news of uh, the dangers as they see it, threatening them in their, in their countries and debating what is the real balance of forces between the classes at the present time. So that's next week. To what is the extent of the danger and the threat from reaction? Okay.